This time on Captain Cass's laboratory, we're going to be working on an octo swing that was sent in. Um, I might break this up into two parts, depending on how long it takes, but this unit has a bad circuit board. Uh, it is, well, it's got no lights, it's got no sound. These don't swing out like they're supposed to. Well, I guess I should show one that the camera can see. The only thing that works is this spins continuously. So I'm going to plug it in. Well, or turn it on, to rephrase that, so you can see. So the top's off, so you can see it, and I have the screws out, but I have the piece in the center to hold this from popping off. So volume's up. It doesn't reset. So it's all the way up, and now I'm going to turn it off. And this is all it does. So... On or off, it just spins. It just spins because it's not resetting. It's not resetting because the circuit board is not picking up the motion. It's just sending power through the relay in the base. The only way to turn it off is to literally pull the power. If I put the power back in, it auto resets. So that part's working, which is the relay on the board. And now it's, well, it's off until I turn the switch on. So. I said this was just held in to help keep it center. So here's the swinging arms. And there's the rat's nest inside. The yellow and white wire that are hanging are the lights that go up to the top. But what's happening is, is this blue relay right here is the reversing and forward relay. It's not getting any power. So that's why we get no swing motion, no power to the rotor fingers, and no power to the rotor up here, which makes this little motor right there do its job. There's also no power going to the sound chip, which is right there. So this blob chip got fried, and I mean it got fried. So the incoming power, all it's doing is sending power up to the spinning motor, which is right here. Um, so this red and this black wire right here coming off the bottom of the board is stuck in perpetual motion which means it turns on when you turn the switch on and it just spins. There's no real component. The only thing that's supposed to happen is, is it's supposed to disconnect once the power is turned off and it gets back to its reset position. Um, it can't detect its reset position, so the motor never turns off. So I thought, okay, well, we got maybe a bad transistor, but a transistor will only usually take out a moving component. Most of these transistors right here in this bank, there's four right there, they do the lights. So don't want to need to worry about those. So now we just have these four. Um, just doing a clip-on test. They seem to be working like they're supposed to when I send power to them with it unplugged. So I'm like, hmm, capacitors are good. There's one there, there's one there. So you got a capacitor there, capacitor there, you got two there. These little flat things right here are capacitors. Uh, you know what? I'll zoom in. It might make it easier for everyone to see. And then we'll recenter this for you. So Q8 and through Q5 going backwards. Lights. That's why these resistors are here. It's not just to resist the power going to there, it's to resist the power going to the lights, because every light in here, you got a couple different colors, they're different amperages. So we need to resist the power. This is what causes your lights to pulsate. Uh, this circuit's getting no power. This, 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 and this, these four, so Q1, Q4, Q2, and Q3, with these capacitors, C5, C3, C8, C7, C6, um, they control uh, the static in the, the components. They also control backwards and forwards and the spinning motion in one direction. Uh, this one is a smoothing capacitor for the blob chip, which is right there. That's why it says IC1, which means integrated circuit one, which is the blob chip. This is the relay that goes click, goes one direction, click, reverses it. 
this transistor with this diode work with it and it helps make the circuit complete. Uh, it does have an ability for a second relay, probably for a, another circuit branch or another board, and that's probably what all these are for that aren't used, possibly even these over here. Um, then we have, of course, the plug and play for your speaker. That's what SP stands for. And then this guy right here, which is the upper motor. So, so all these resistors, there's three here, there's two there, there's two there, and all these work fine when you, and of course these, sorry, when I do a meter test across them to check their ohms, make sure they're not open, they're not burnt, they're not destroyed. Uh, they're different size resistors. You got the quarter watts and then the eighth watts, which is interesting that they changed them, but that's why these are so much smaller than these. And they come in much larger sizes too. You can get resistors as big as your thumb and just as long, usually not in these houses, but just as an example. So after diagnosing this for a while and uh, dealing with what I can, I'm determined that this blob chip right here probably got smoked, meaning that it shorted out or the wrong power supply was plugged into it, which is very possible. It's very common. You have a five uh, millimeter barrel plug, you grab a 12 volt AC adapter, and if you're lucky, you just burn out the incoming power, one of the smoothing capacitors or one of the resistors. But unfortunately, if the power goes through it quick enough before this stuff has a chance to burn, your blob chip right here is what gets sacrificed. And once you lose your blob chip, that controls everything. That's why it's an integrated circuit. That's why it says IC1. Uh, so, the person that owns this would like it to motion to work and lights. Okay, so we're going to get rid of this circuit board because it's pretty much useless. And we're going to make a circuit that does lights and install a circuit that does the motion. Uh, what's nice is the spinning motion can be wired literally right off the switch. There's, it just spins. It just needs to be turned on and off. But we need to be able to have the arms swing out and in, out and in, um, without hitting their stoppers. So here is this. Uh, it might be too close for the camera. It's kind of, it's because it's moving. So here is the arc that the arms travel in. And this is what pushes the arms in and out. So as it turns, it, this pushes this back, which swings the arms out. And then here's the end. And then these screws are the over-travel stops. There's one on each. Oh, there's three. Right there. And one thing about this piece, and I'm going to zoom out now because uh, I'm trying to keep it centered is kind of hard. There we go. So one of the things that's interesting about this piece that I wish a lot of them use is this has a magnetic clutch. And I mentioned this in the first one. And that was the biggest issue with the first one I worked on. This stack of gears, if you see the silver in the middle, are two neodymium magnets. These two gears are sh sharing the same shaft, but they're not attached to each other. They spin freely from each other. What keeps them spinning together is those, that magnet. And that magnet is the clutch. Because if you put a circuit in here, which I'm going to show you is right there, uh, to make this go in and out, if your timing's off or it has to reset, it'll still spin in one direction, but this will stop when it hits the over travel and it'll just jump the clutch, which is perfect because it makes this circuit move this out and in like it's supposed to. And if the timing is off because the it loses power in the middle or something. When it resets this to zero, this may not be set at zero, meaning all the way in, um, the clutch will compensate. And basically how this works is, I'm just going to set this together. This is called an H bridge circuit. Uh, the letter H. No other hidden or silent letters after that. And what as you can tell, here's the relay. Same kind of relay that's on that board. This one's slightly longer. 
and it's a different color, different manufacturer, and it can also handle a higher voltage. The one on the board is only rated up to like 12 volts, and this guy is rated up to... Hundred and twenty volts. <laughs> Took me a second. I had to use magnifiers. Um, so this one can handle a lot more power than the one that's in there. Hence the reason it's slightly larger. Now that hundred and twenty volts or five volts, which is the minimum it can run at, so it can't run at four and a half. And that's going to come up here in a moment as well. So at one hundred and twenty volts or DC twenty four volts, it can only run a maximum of two amps through it before it burns the, the relay up. So you have to be kind of conscious of what you're running on this. Now, the little motor that comes in these guys draw between one and 200 milliamps. We're talking negligible amounts of power. Now, when they're under a load, they might bump up to a tenth of an amp, which is 0.1 amps. It's still negligible power. It's not going to hurt this relay. Um, but, as I just mentioned, this circuit cannot work below 5 volts. These houses are four and a half, or Limax in general. Now, this isn't really a house, it's more of a carnival ride. But the point is, is they run at 4.5 volts DC. Sometimes on free float, meaning no load, they might be at 5.1, 5.5. But once you put a load on them, they drop down to 4.2, 4.3. Some of them stay at 4.5, especially the older ones that had the really big transformer, not these newer ones that are thinner. Uh, so that poses a problem. That means we have to convert this house to a minimum of 5 volts, or this piece. Not a problem. Get a 5 volt adapter, 6 volt adapter, 20 volt adapter. It can handle those powers. But you don't want to mix it up with a 4.5 volt adapter. If I plug a 4.5 volts into this, this won't even turn on. The motor will spin in one direction, but this circuitry will not run. Now, this H-Bridge circuit came from Amazon, and I'll put a link below in case you want to try and fiddle with one. They're not that expensive. And this is also an H-Bridge circuit. You can see this one's a lot more massive. This one also has a digital display, which you can set your timing, because it's very important to set your timing, and it gives you your powers, and it has the little buttons that program everything right here. Um, on the back of these boards, this board's the same, uh, excuse me, on this one's on the front. It has your voltage in, your ground, which is your negative, your forward, reverse, and stop. So this one I can program when the arms swing out, I can make the arms stop, stay out there, and then swing back in. This one just goes out, click, in, click, out, click. So it's basically just forward, backward, forward, backwards. Um, and then on this side is your motor in, out, and your power in for the motor. If you notice, this has a couple of different sets of wires on here. These wires here power the circuit board. These wires here power the motor. So it has two incoming power sources. Currently, it's hooked up to two incoming power sources, meaning there's two power sources over there feeding this board. If I hook them together, the board gets screwed up because I need to install diodes or an isolator to isolate the incoming power from the motor so it doesn't detect it as a short across and it just makes the motor spin. But this is also an H-bridge circuit. Or if you don't want to use the incoming power lugs, it has a power port, which looks very familiar since most all Emacs uses this. This does not. Now, the reason I'm not using this, I bought this to test, is this does not fit down here. It is physically too tall. So if you look at the side profiles, you can see this one will fit under the disc or the rotating base or the flat base, sorry, this doesn't rotate. This one doesn't. This one would be more user friendly, but once you program this, you don't have to reprogram it. Uh, this one, you can modify, change your timing. You can still test it and play with it if you want, and I'll put a link to this um, circuit board as well. This one's more expensive, of course, as you can tell, it's a much larger circuit board. So set that one out of the way, since I'm not gonna be using it. Also, that one's not programmed. This one, we spent a little time and programmed it, and here is a motor. This is the same motor that's in here, and this motor I put a little piece of tape on, so you can see that there's a, like a, a flag. There you go, black flag. And I'm going to go ahead and start turning this on so you can see how this works. 
So first, I'm going to turn on the motor. And I'm going to hold it so it switches down. So hopefully you can tell it's spinning in one direction. Now I'm going to turn on the circuit board. So it flashed, let me know there's power. Hear the click. I don't know if you can tell it reversed. Hopefully you can see that. So every five seconds, approximately, it reverses directions. Timing this was the longest part. Programming this to fit this. So we guesstimated by just sending power directly to this motor how long it would take to go from its minimum position to its maximum position. Uh, at four and a half volts, it took about five and a quarter seconds. At five volts, it takes about five seconds. So we programmed this board for about five seconds, which does two things. One, it allows you to get the maximum swing, which Lemax doesn't do. If you watch the first video, the maximum swing is right about the center, which means it's two seconds, give or take, two and a half at the most. And then it goes back. Also, if you watch that video, you'll notice that these stoppers don't go to the end. So if you have to do something like this, you can actually set the timing on a circuit board such as this to give your swing a farther arc and a longer arc for duration, not for how far out it goes. The farther arc is the, the farther part. Once the screws hit the stoppers, if you're off, if your calculation is off by a second, you got a centrifugal clutch right here. It spins. It doesn't bind up any of the gears. It doesn't break anything. And if you're worried about the clutch having a problem, you can put a very, very small amount, like a half a drop of oil on the two surfaces of the magnets or grease. You don't want a lot because you still need the magnets to move. You don't want them to constantly slip. So put on, I put on a small drop of the super lube grease and then I wiped it off. So it leaves just a very, very, very fine residue that fills in all the pores, reduces the chance of excessive friction buildup if the timing fails. Now, as you can tell, it's working just fine. What you have to do next is, well, we've got to separate all the light wires, separate the colors, separate the dome from the base because one's yellow, one's green. Find a lighting circuit. Um, which we'll probably end up building, but we need to find the wires for the rotor, which is on that plug, I already found it, and then we need to wire this in and reset this for 5 volts. And then here is a jumper I made for the motor, for here, this is just one, this is the negative, hence the black stripe. Uh, this is a diode. Um, this is a 1N 4004 diode. I think I have another one lying over here in this little pile for the positive. And what that does is the diode stops power from going the wrong direction, which means you won't backfeed this circuit board. This motor is going forward and backward, forward and backward. So if I took this wire and put it right here, when this motor switches, it's trying to also backfeed this polarity right here, which is bad. So we need to make sure that the power that goes from here to here is isolated so it can only go in one direction. So there's no reversing and going back into this power wire. And then this would be soldered there to the inside where the power port is. Uh, at which point we'd also have a branch off to the motor that goes right here. So it can just spin constantly in a circle. And we'll have another branch off that goes to a circuit board that controls the lights. Now, the circuit board may not be a circuit board per se, such as this. The circuit board will probably be a breadboard, a small one, like this. Which this one has a couple of transistors and a resistor already in it from a, um, a sound circuit I was building. Um, it's got double back tape, so you can actually stick this in. So if your components are 
low enough, or I'll give you an example, if your resistor is too high, which I wouldn't cut it this big, you can fold it over so it fits underneath the space. These little breadboards, um, they come in colors. I got them in like black, red, green, white. I got them in a, a lot from a garage sale. But these little boards you can get on Amazon as well. You can also use, I'm trying to get it out. Wherever it went, give me a second. You can also use something like this. So uh, this also came from the same garage cell. They soldered a wire through and you can see it's much thinner. This is just push in. You just push the components in and each line across is connected. So these two transistors, this middle, the right leg on one left are sharing the same power source or the same track because they're on the same row. So all five of these holes are together and all five of these holes are together and then you just run jumpers back and forth. They don't go this way, they go that way. This one, if I wanted to connect multiple together, like this person did, they put a big solder blob that covers one, two, three of these copper pads. You can also use jumpers, kind of like on the original circuit board, you saw these bare wires. Uh, uh, here's one I just threw away. You can make jumpers like this. So it's just a piece of bare wire that's soldered through to connect two of the connections together. There's another one there too. This was a control board for a computer and I wanted to take some of the components off, which are right there. So there's a few different ways. This might be easier once I build the circuit than this because of all the soldering. Um, and if something fails, this is easier to replace. You just pull the component out, put the new component in. Uh, it just depends on what's going to be the easiest process once I start working on it. You got to be careful because sometimes you get boards like this. And if you look, there's connected tracks. So everything on this side is connected and everything on this side is connected. So hot and not or negative and positive. This can also work for you. If you're building a light circuit, you can solder all your components across what you need. But if you're trying to solder a resistor to a light wire, that means the resistor has to have the light wire soldered to the end and it sticks up. It won't sit f across flush like that. So there are several different things and this board you probably won't find because if you can see it, it says Radio Shack. <laughs> it's really old. And whatever the board DIP1 is, I'm not sure. But there's the top where you put your components. And there's the bottom where you solder. So this board might work too because I'm just doing lights and lights are just going to be resistors maybe something to make them pulsate. I have to look at some videos of what this thing did originally. Try and replicate it as best as possible. Um, if you want to get really fancy, you can put an Arduino in there. I probably wouldn't recommend it. It's kind of a pain. Uh, hopefully you can still hear me while I'm going through my circuitry in the, behind the bench. Yeah, so here's more of those boards you can see. Blue, red, white, green. So I have several and they come with belt back tape, so I don't have to worry about hot glue. And the reason I say I might do this in two parts is I might use a larger breadboard like that to build the lighting circuit and test it since I can plug my power directly into it. And then I can go ahead and integrate it in here. Also, if you notice, this has a negative and then it has a voltage A and a voltage B. That's what the V stands for. That means when something like this that takes two power sources, I can actually run two power sources to feed my circuit for testing. Whereas this, I had to use literally two power sources off screen, a whole bunch of wires, as you can see here. So that's where we're at. Normally I don't film things that are duplicated because they're the same problem over and over and over again. This one is not. This one is a bad circuit board. She really wants it to function. She doesn't care about the sound, which is great because 
I can have the sound reproduced, but it's going to cost money. And that's the problem. And then you have to integrate another component in here because I've already had sound reproduced for some of my display, uh, not for a house specifically, but basic soundtracks for the room itself. And it usually starts at around 40 bucks. So, and it goes up. <laughs> so you can do it. You just can't do it all the time. that sort of delay there. So I want to show you how this works. So I need to connect power to that rotor. So that way you can see this spin. So let's uh, put this off to the side. So I want to show you how it works on this which doesn't want to stay where I want it to go. Wrong size. Right size. <clears throat> so it's a relatively educational video, um, but you probably need to watch the majority of it so you don't uh, miss anything because this is a lot of circuitry so the red and the black wire that go to the top should be this right here and I will test it so I'm going to use a couple of pin connectors, which I had two. Heck, the other one go. One of these years, like I said, I'll be cleaning this workbench. Just so you know, these motors can go up to 6 volts. So if I change this to 5 volts, it's not going to hurt the motor. It just means it spins faster. Okay, so that's this motor. And as you saw, this is set for 5 volts. You can see it's spinning just fine. So that means that this red wire, so I had the red and black wires reversed, and this black wire are my top rotor assembly. doesn't just peel off. There we go. So 
So this should just make the motor spin. Let's get it set on. That does is it helps keep it from lifting. You can see the motor spinning, but you notice the arms aren't swinging out. That's because it's in the wrong direction. But it's spinning because the clutch is doing its job. Now if I do it this way, arms swing out. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, but that's how it works. Is it works in both directions by using. Uh, just reversing the power and engaging the clutch. All right, so now let's hook it up to this little circuit board and look at it work in action. The part that you're anticipating. Now on this circuit board, those stamps are on the bottom. VN, ground, P minus, P plus, which is your secondary power source, M minus M plus, which is your motors negative and positive. Now on these DC motors, they reverse polarity. So um, it doesn't really matter, but basically if you want to keep it close to the same, uh, black in the negative, red in the positive, and you're, you're fine. It's not, not gonna, it doesn't matter if you reverse it. So. Just folding the strands over because normally I put a little bit of solder on them before putting them in here so they're a little thicker and something more meaty to grab onto. But since I'm just doing this to show proof of concept before a uh, complete installation, I'm just going to bend the wire over to make the wire a little thicker so the screw terminal has something to grab onto. Once this is complete, it'll I will solder the end of the wire and then stick it in there. And what that does is it gives it a more solid connection for the screws to compress. These are just compression screws. They just compress down onto the wire and hold it in place. Now, let's make sure I have a good connection. So connection for the motor is good. That's the reason the arm's pulled in. Now we need to power the circuit board. One there, and one there. So circuit board flashes, let me know it's got power. And now if I turn this on, which is on the third power source, it should spin. Which again, that doesn't matter, it won't turn back off because the board's bad. Now, Here's going to be the downside of this, um, besides not having sound. The downside is you have to turn this off when the arms are down. If I turn it off right now, the arms will stay out. Oh, I'm sorry, I turned off the board, not the motor. So let's do that again. So if it's, we'll swing out in a second. Right now it's, it's uh, spinning the clutch. So. So if I kill power, oh, it's stuck out now. So now that's how it's going to sit. Now, if that's a permanent all year round display that you may have on a master switch, because this will no longer be affected by the uh, turn it off from here and have it reset part, because the circuit board's bad. This circuit board doesn't care. It auto resets every time power comes on. There's a little red light. You might see it. It flashes three times to tell it, hey, it's, I got power. We're going to start the process. It doesn't care what position it's in. It's just going to do its job. 
That's why on this piece, the centrifugal clutch, or excuse me, the magnetic clutch comes in handy. It comes in handy because it doesn't care if it gets reset. Now the circuitry factory from Limax probably did, and it cared a lot, and now it doesn't work. But this circuit board doesn't. So I'm gonna go ahead and set it so it goes all the way back down. So if you're turning this off and you're gonna put it away in its box at the end of the season or what have you, you're gonna to have to do this manually. You're gonna to have to make it so once it goes all the way in, you kill the power. And that's it. So I've taken a non-functional piece that all's did was spin in a circle when you turn this on. It never stopped. Oh, and it was a godly look noisy. I thought it just had a bad motor or a loose connection. Uh, it was. One of the screws here was missing on the um, motor. Though, not this motor here, but that motor there. <clears throat> that one. Because it's noisy. The one of the screws was missing, so this was rubbing. And I went ahead and reset it. And put it all back together. And it wasn't turning off still. I had to unplug it each time from here or the wall socket. Um, so I started doing diagnosis on the circuit board. Uh, whenever you take this apart, you have to cut the light wires. Uh, they just, unless you put a connection in the middle, they always have to be cut. Uh, the top's over there with the octopus and its LEDs that are in it. Um, I fed the wires out the side because I don't want them touching anything. Even though there's no power on them, I, I don't want them arcing another component while I'm doing any testing. Um, there, there should be power on them. There wasn't because it's a bad circuit board. So I actually spoke with another YouTuber um, who's smarter than me. I'm not going to lie. Uh, he goes by Big Clive on YouTube. Uh, he's a very technical guy. So if you're not into technical stuff, uh, you're not going to understand or enjoy or care. Uh, he also does some fun stuff too, kind of the kind of the stuff that we do. And actually, he was the inspiration for us starting our YouTube channel. Um, but if you want to check out his stuff, I'll link his channel below. Basically, um, he's overseas. He's in uh, the Isle of Man, which if you don't know where that is, it's England. And he's a technical YouTuber where he tears stuff apart and shows you how it works, shows you how to make things better, especially with a lot of the stuff coming from China. And then also, of course, uh, does some random fun stuff like making uh, flavored alcohols or using um, a distiller to increasing the strength of alcohol, which that's why I bought a distiller. So I can try that because um, I've never done it that way. I've made alcohol stronger using a different process. But the point is, is um, I've spoke with him a few times over the course of a, a week or so. And we kind of figured out how to make this at least function in the sense that it reverses the motor and makes it go in and out, in and out. So I, I appreciate assistance from other people in the YouTube community. He is not a villager. So, I mean, if you're watching this because you have a village type setup, there is no village stuff on there. But if you want to see how to uh, use a soda stream improperly or uh, what makes your hair dryer work, uh, the new computerized ones, or if you want to build lighting circuits, some of the lighting circuits I built um, were based on his. Uh, some of them are just mine. Uh, some of them are just random ones you find. Um, I've also used some of his 3D print files for uh, decorations I have in my house. Uh, he just has random stuff, but it's it's technical. Um, it's it's real technical stuff. So, but I'll get on the link below. But if it wasn't for his assistance, um, finding the proper terminology for this circuitry, H-bridge, I was looking for reversing circuits constantly and um, trying to see if I could build one. So with his uh, help, I was able to find different ones and then I bought all of the ones I could find and found that this one fits inside here. So this one is the one I'm going to stick with. Now, the other one might come in handy for other stuff. I mean, if you want to put an external box that you plug everything in and then plug the box into here, kind of like an external battery pack that some Limax pieces come with, uh, you could actually use the other circuit board in a hobby box. So, um, and that hobby box has wires in it. So you've got choices. 
So the next step, which is why I'm probably going to break this up into multiple parts, at least two, maybe three, is because of how long it's going to take. And I wanted to give you good, full, clear info on how to do this. I, this will not work with every piece. So don't think, oh, this will fix this and this will fix. No, this will fix certain things, especially if it has a clutch. I've only come across two Limax pieces that have a clutch. Two. Uh, this one, the Octo Swing, and the Grindstone or head, head Grindstone Mill from last year. One of the components has a clutch. One of the seven things that move. So that's why I said this this circuitry, this H bridge, does work, but you will be limited on what you can use it in. Sorry. Um, now, if you have something, uh, Mr. Christmas uses spring clutches. So if you have Mr. Christmas, it might work. A spring clutch is similar to this as far as the magnetic clutch but it's a spring that when it gets too tight it jumps it pushes the gear out of alignment so the two instead of the teeth sitting meshed like this it pushes the gear out it spins and then the gear locks back in and what that does is it helps prevent the gears from breaking um, i believe there is one other Limax piece that uses a spring clutch as well they're not common um, they're more mechanical the springs can break and if the spring gets gummed up with the grease full of dirt and uh, dust, the spring can't do its job. It binds the teeth up and you snap the gears. So they're not as common on Limax. And I don't know how well this H-bridge circuit would work with a spring clutch. A magnetic clutch, perfect, because it's a magnet. And I kind of wish more of the pieces would go to that direction. Now, I did notice here in the 2023 series, the one piece where it's got the uh, jiggling cages on the front. I, I don't remember the piece, although I own it. Um, they use magnets. They use magnets with electromagnets that make them shake. So they are starting to go more into the magnetic sphere of things. Um, this being an older piece, so this is the only one I've seen that's had that magnetic clutch right there. And I, I think it's a great thing. So I can, you can see all the gears moving. So if I turn this, the wrong way. I want to turn it so you'll see the gears spinning or the clutch slipping. So I'm not as fast as electricity. You gotta give me a second here. There we go. So now it's all the way at its stopping point. The screws have hit the stopper and that's why there's a little bit of slack there. So I'm going to turn this and if you notice the gear on the top is turning. See it right there. But the gear on the bottom is not. And that's that magnetic clutch. And like I said, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie, probably the, one of the greatest innovations I've seen in the Limax piece to help salvage the gears. And that's why on this piece, uh, the, only time, the only thing I've ever seen is burned out motors because of the grease issue, uh, especially that one, um, because the grease from this drips onto that and burns out the motor. But uh, belts, they eat through the belts. The belts wear out. Um, it's a lot of stress, especially on this motor where it swings in and out. There's more stress on this belt than this belt that just spins in a circle. Uh, so the centrifugal clutch helps preserve all of those gears right there. And especially that one, which is the impossible gear, which of course you can now get now from Mr. Christmas. Uh, this also has the impossible gear right here. So if this gets caught, meaning it quits rotating, you will break the gears here. There is no clutch. But this clutch helps preserve the top and you from damaging the pivots, the arms, the balls, etc. So I give Limax praise where it's due, and I give them crap where it's due. Uh, I, I, and I'm not partial to one company over another as far as how they build their stuff. I know they build it to make it... Um, as cost, to, uh, cost savings as possible for maximizing profit. So that's how all corporations seem to work. And that's that's how the world works. It's fine. Um, but this piece will work perfectly with this piece. I haven't tried them all. So if you ask questions about other rotating pieces that have multiple rotations, meaning spin and out or what have you, kind of like the um, Octos, I think it's the Octo Squeeze that goes up and down. I don't know if it's going to work because it doesn't use a clutch. <laughs> it uses 
um, micro switches that switch directions and go back and forth, back and forth. Um, there's no timing on it. You have to use those micro switches. But it has two, two means of motion. It has two motors. One motor that spins in a circle, another motor that engages the arm so they go up and down, up and down on the uh, cam track that's inside. But we're at uh, oh, about 45 minutes in here, and I've uh, just been rambling on about uh, technical stuff. So we're going to stop here, and I'm going to start taking this apart. And you're like, oh, I want to see to take it apart. You know, you take it apart. It's really easy. Let me set that over here. Uh, there's two screws. Take them out. Two screws. Take the speaker out. Cut all the wires. Uh, except for the ones you can unplug, like this guy. Uh, because none of it matters, the circuit board doesn't work. But when you do remove everything, you need to isolate the LEDs. So like this green and white wire, which is light green, goes to these LEDs. This black and dark green wire goes to these LEDs. And then you need to figure out the patterns. So all these black and green and all these white and light green. And then this one is green and gray because they flash in separate patterns, or they pulsate, however you want to word it. I've kind of looked up. I was working on a circuit to do that, which is right here, but this only does two, meaning it only it, two lights, but it can do two strings of lights. This has like five different patterns. That's why there's so many wires for the lights. And I don't mean patterns as it changes patterns. I mean patterns as this string of lights is different than this string of lights, which is different than this string of lights, which is different than that string of lights, which is different than the string of lights that go to this yellow and white wire. So you have five pulsating patterns. So I might condense it down only for space saving. Yeah, there's a lot of room in here, but there's not a lot of depth in here. And also I need to be very conscious of power consumption. Uh, I'm going to get a five volt adapter and it'll probably be one or two amps but I also don't want to make it so it gets overheated and I don't want it to um, look horrible. And also, the more circuitry you have, the more apt it is to fail, hence here. But we already have a complicated circuit here, which you can actually build on a board like that size or a breadboard, or you can just buy one way easier. Um, and I still have to deal with the fact that I'm going to have multiple, one incoming power with multiple splits of power at different uh, amperage draws. So I, I want to make sure I have enough room to build everything and not have it crowded. So, But other than that, um, and also you could technically remove this and just put an off on switch either here or here, because this is mostly for the volume that it's not going to have anymore. So that's another option. Instead of having this cable that runs out and then you got to hide the cable, uh, this is exaggerated, but you can put a push button in here. On, off. And you can even do it without. So it's just this little black piece that sticks out that goes on, off. Um, so there are other options that we're going to look into on this, this build or this modification to make it mostly functional. So I probably will get rid of this and just make an on off button on the back to uh, just easier to deal with. Because again, you can leave it on and just kill master power by either unplugging it from here or there. Or if you have it on a switch like I do, all my stuff's on a master power switch. I flip it on and I flip on the sections of the room at a time. The ones that have to be reset, I turn those off manually first and then we're on our way. Uh, this one will no longer have to be a manual turn off. It just turn off. The only part that's going to make a difference is where you turn it off in relationship to where these balls are in their arc. So. Hopefully it's not too confusing. I'm hoping it, it, uh, it helps people with this piece. So I know this is a very sought after piece. And I know, um, well... They don't make spare parts. So I know that making it function for your display would be great. So outside of that, uh, we're going to do our best to make this work so I can get sent back to her since Halloween's rolling up here in like, oh, I don't know, less than three or about three months. So here we are. This is what we have. This is what we're using. Part of it. 
I need to make a circuit. I need to cut the wires and then mark them off to say which is which. Make sure that I figure out which is the hot and which is the not. I'm assuming the green wire, which I can tell when I unscrew this board, is probably the negative. And that the black, the white, and the gray are the different positives from the different lighting circuits. which we got purple and gray that goes up into the body which probably goes to these lights that are right here uh, the purples and greens are all soldered together then the whites the blacks the grays and the uh, well these greens the different color greens are all isolated on the board and they all come off of these again because these are your light controllers for your pulse the fades however you want to call them so and then the top lights, also the yellow, apparently is, oh, that's weird. That one, this guy at the end right here is what does your dome lights top, the octopus. It's weird they don't have the yellow soldered with the other ones over there. They're isolated completely. I mean, it is connected on the track, but I'm surprised they didn't just solder it here and they ran it over here. This track is all one track. This is the negative track that runs around the board and ends right here. So. I think the blob chip got hot. This um, resin cover that covers the IC is really distorted right at the end in there so I'm wondering if it got overheated and it cracked so but tis what it is we're gonna do our best to make it function again and since I'm here get the speaker out of the way so if also if you have something like this you now technically have spare parts you have a spare large speaker which is also strange for the Halloween um, Halloween usually uses the cheaper speakers and the Christmas displays usually have the better speakers. But this is an actual cardboard cone with um, a pigtail that you can unplug. A lot of the Halloween displays have a plastic cone and they're soldered to the board. Some of the newer ones now have the pigtail. It's still the same 8 ohm half watt as um, either. But usually the Christmas ones because these have a better sound quality than the other speakers. Uh -huh. And we now know from testing that this is the spinning motor. And then here are your switch right here. So there's five wires on, on average that come from your switch. So we have a blue, a yellow, a gray, a white. And a green. So we have the blue, yellow, and green, which go here, which is your sound. That's the reason your sound chip's right there. Your, excuse me, sound chip. When I say sound chip, it's your amplifier chip. The sound actually comes from the blob chip, runs across the track to the amplifier. The amplifier then sends it up to here and then goes back to so your volume. Um, and then you have your incoming power, which interrupts the on off, is your gray and your white right there. And then the red wire right there is your incoming power right yar and then this thin white wire is the negative which goes uh, right next to the red wire so this just connects the incoming power to the rest of the board so it turns on that's your off on switch so if you were um, looking to see why you're power doesn't turn on everything in here looks good you look at these solder joints here these solder joints here and these three solder joints here as well as the solder joints on the back of your incoming power port because I don't know if you can tell I might just zoom in real quick I'll do it again there you go going down going down hopefully there we go So, 
This is your switch, the gray and the white, the fat ones. So this is where the power comes in, which is the white and the red right there. So the white sends, the red comes in, power goes up to white. Your switch turns it on, sends it back down to gray, which charges this entire track, which the components on the other side of the track make everything go to where it needs to go. Your blob chip board right here, you can see all the different spans that come off and then go to all the other components. That's why if your blob chip goes out, you lose a lot of stuff. Uh, here's your volume. You can see there's the three wires right there. You can see it's one, two, and three. And just in a straight row. It starts off with yellow on the bottom, green in the middle, and blue on the top. So bottom being this side, which is this side of the board. As far as this motor that's always spinning when you get power, it connects right here, which if you look, if you trace the track, this is the hot track, there's the motor, this is the negative track, there's the power. So that's why as soon as you flip on the switch, the thing starts spinning immediately. It bypasses all components, it's direct drive 4.5 volts. No resistors, no nothing. Um, there is... just the smoothing capacitor. They're using that as their smoothing capacitor, this tall thin one here. A smoothing capacitor so it doesn't backfeed the motor noise into the circuit. Uh, you need to have a smoothing capacitor on motors or else your circuit gets really noisy, which means things malfunction. And you can burn stuff out. And then this and this is the other motor, which is right here. And that's the smoothing capacitor for that motor which is much smaller because this one's in the circuit. This one is before the circuit. So this can send more noise into the circuit. So that's why this one's slightly bigger. This one's in the circuit. So it can be slightly smaller, meaning that it has to go through all this and all these components in that chip because of the reset uh, before it gets to these two wires. Alrighty. And the reason I'm doing a zoom in is I needed a circuit board picture before and I might as well show you now in case you want to take yours apart and try and repair it. So these are all your light wires. This is the yellow and white for the top. The white wire goes to that end transistor right there. And that does your dome and that's your ground, which is over here. And if you trace this track all the way around, it's the negative track. So. You have a bundle here of greens and purples. Your next is a bundle of purples. Again, another set of greens, and you got a set of whites, a set of whites. Oh, blacks, and a separate black, and then grays, and a separate gray. That's what I'm talking about. There's so many lighting paths for different pulsings of the lights that I might have to combine a couple, because we're talking... Oh, one, two, three, four, five, about six paths complete, maybe five. That's a lot of lighting circuit stuff. Uh, I mean, on this board, if, if yours fries and you want to salvage components, you can pretty much salvage everything on here except for the blob chip right there. And I don't know if you can see in the light, but kind of see where the light right here is shining a spot and the rest of it's a line. That spot is damaged to this epoxy. Um, I'm not sure if it's damaged from manufacturing or if it's damaged because it got hot. Because if you get this epoxy hot enough, it melts. But the problem is when it melts, it takes the chip off with it and destroys everything. So, but that is a relative close up of the board. So you can actually see the resistor colors in case you have one that fries. Uh, you can kind of see the capacitors where they're all located, the different styles, ceramic and um, electrolytic, so the tall, thin ones. You can see where the transistors are located and see that all these over here and all these over here are all blank and are supposed to be for this model, this piece. And it even has a jumper. So if you see this is burnt, you're like, oh, it broke. And well, you just solder the wire back together. And there's another jumper there, another jumper there. But if uh, yours fries and you want to keep the board for parts, uh, you can pretty much use any of this on anything else as long as the color codes or the numbers match up. And you 
can even reuse the amplifier chip if the amplifier chip's good. You just desolder it from the bottom. Just those four and those four, and you can pop it into your other one. 90% of all the amplifier chips I've seen in Liam Max are the same, and even the ones that aren't, if you cross-reference the part numbers, which are engraved on the top, you just use a magnifier to read them. You can cross-reference and find out that they're pretty much the same. The difference is how loud they get in most cases. Um, the pinouts are generally always the same. You just It's called a data sheet when you look it up. Uh, you can even remove these if you want and use them as spares in case you take yours apart and you break your plastic clip for the motor on the newer ones or on just the light and the motor or the speaker. So, And even this relay is still good, believe it or not. Uh, if you send power to the pins on the bottom, it clicks like it's supposed to. It just doesn't do anything else because it's not being told what to do by that guy there. So, yeah, well, that's where we're at. So, next step is to put this in here. Um, put this, here we go, in here. Uh, run all the wires, remove this, and start the process. Isolate and tape off these so I know which goes where. Figure out the pattern to use and see if it's replicatable to the best of its ability. So, but yeah, now we're like an hour and change in, so I'm gonna stop it here. I'm gonna zoom back out first, wherever my zoom is. There we go. I'm gonna pause it here, start this process, and then we'll be back with the next one. So, this is the end of part one, which is very technical. Hopefully um, it made sense. Hopefully I described it as good as I can for you to understand. Uh, you can always ask questions, um, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. I will put the links below for everything I've mentioned, so that and the bigger one that I put away, uh, and the motors if you need a motor, or the belt kit, gear kit, so on and so forth. I will link Big Clive stuff below as well, since, of course, without his um, assistance, I wouldn't be repairing this right now. This is one of two really big repairs. When I say really big, is I mean they're really technical. This is a complete lighting and wiring for the motors, and the other one is a massive lighting undertaking project, which will probably be a few videos from now because I want to get a few more of these pieces done and cleared out before I start another one that's going to take time, lots and lots of time. So, but I'm going to try and keep up with these, get them out to you as quick as I can with the best description as possible, and hopefully they assist you in your uh, repairs yourself, so that way you don't have to pay somebody to fix them or throw them away because you know, they're broke, they're not repairable. So hopefully this assists everybody and gives you options for ones like this that are really hard to find and really expensive if you do find them. So, until the next one, whether it's this or a different video, because they're not always in order, have a good one.